Hello, and welcome to the Andwise Podcast. We are delighted to have you here spending some time with us. Andwise is a technology platform that aims to empower medical students, trainees, and early career physicians to navigate the complex financial journey that we all find ourselves on as we aim to help others. Thanks for joining us. Cheers. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Andwise podcast. We have another guest with us today, one of our medical advisory board members, Dr. Bloomfield. Thank you so much for joining. He's a pediatrician by training. He's done some cool stuff afterwards. He's worked for Moderna, AstraZeneca. Now he works for Premier Research, but I'll let him introduce himself since I can never do justice to anyone's bio. Sure. Adam Bloomfield. I'm a pediatrician, as Avern mentioned. I live uh, in New Jersey, where I've lived almost my entire life, right outside of New York City. I trained in New York City. I practiced general pediatrics for 15 years, where for the last five or so, I was the managing partner of the practice. We also, interestingly, created a practice without walls, where we had merged initially three practices, and now I believe there's about nine that are in this super group in New Jersey. In 2015, I was for some reason approached by AstraZeneca to work as a medical director. I figured I would take a, a chance at something different and I moved into industry. I was there for about five or six years with a quick stop at a small biotech that had taken some of the business from AstraZeneca. And then the pandemic came and I worked as a senior director for global medical affairs for Moderna during the vaccine rollout. I was there for roughly a year and I'm now executive director for rare diseases and pediatrics at a small to mid-sized CRO called Premier Research, where I run a team of seven medical monitors who monitor between 40 and 50 clinical trials on any given day uh, around the globe. Four of the monitors are in uh, the US and three are in Europe. And I work very closely with our business development team also on some really interesting proposals. I do a lot of consulting within a lot of it is in cell and gene therapy, rare diseases, general pediatrics, et cetera. I I practice medicine. I was in big pharma, small biotech startup, and now I'm on the CRO side. I also worked initially when Doximity was getting started as one of the first Doximity Fellows about 10 years ago when they were first launching Doximity, they were working with a bunch of physicians to get them off the ground. It's been an interesting career so far. Hopefully not over yet. Hopefully I have some more time in me. That's amazing. Yeah, there's an incredible amount of interest for doctors coming out. Nowadays, I see a lot of people posting about how to break into these non-clinical roles, leadership roles, research-based roles that are not necessarily direct patient care. A lot of people feel that even despite having an MD or a DO, they might not be well qualified for these roles. Your undergrad, you studied mathematics, right? I was looking back and then you went to medical school. After medical school or after your peds residency or during, did you have much research experience or you mentioned they recruited you, right? AstraZeneca or a different company? Yeah, it was AstraZeneca. I had done research as an undergrad. I was at the University of Michigan, which I think has a really excellent research program in just about every area of medicine. I was fortunate to work in a really amazing lab in nephrology. It was a preclinical work and it was rabbits working on the proximal convoluted tubule and all kinds of stuff like that. So four years, I started out washing glassware, washing beakers. And then by the end of the fourth year, I was running studies, uh, HPLC all by myself. It was great learning experience, but I also worked some summers at the Spinal Cord Damage Research Center in in the Bronx VA. When I went into medicine, I did not do any research at all. And primarily, the reason I think they reached out to me was because I had experience working on the practice management side and putting businesses together. And I think that's a lot of what pharma biotech is looking for, is not just that you can understand the science, but also the business side of drug research, because if you can just talk science, it's not going to be enough. You have to 
be able to meet with business development on all sides and understand the nuances that go on uh, in the developmental process. My personal feeling is, it, unless there's some real reason not to, I think if you go to medical school, you should try to do a residency and try to get some clinical experience. I think it, it really does pay off. And I used to see, I think I did the math, 5,000 patients a year times 15 years. 65,000 patient encounter or something like that. You learn a tremendous amount that doing that, that you can't get that experience anywhere else. And it's very valuable. Also, I know that the days of the private practices that are not affiliated with hospital systems or, or large health systems is, is coming to an end or seems to be. Even so, there's a lot to learn from working on contracts and legal documents and everything that goes along with working as a physician that's not just seeing patients that you learn from that time of your career. I think it's important. And sometimes when I'm in a room with individuals on my team, I'm the only one that's ever touched a patient or can say, I've seen that disease, or I know how to treat it, or I know what the patient journey is like for someone with X disease. And it's valuable input. Now, there are many who just want to go right into research in this, and that's fine too. I think that's also another great path. I think that, I don't know how you feel about this, Varun, but I tell individuals who are interested in getting outside of clinical practice, moving on, that LinkedIn is a really important tool. It's just the place where a lot of hiring takes place and recruiters reach out. And it's big, even in, in medicine and research, you have to be involved in LinkedIn with a good profile if you want to be attractive to recruiters and put the recruiters to work for you. They get paid. It based on finding you a job, that's how they make their money. So tell them, go find me a great job. And if they work hard enough, they'll find you something that works. But there's, there's pros and cons to, to both sides, to clinical practice and to working in industry. It's just, just a different experience. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. You said so many important things there. One, the residency piece. I've had close friends, family members that have been in the middle of difficult surgical five, six year residencies and towards the senior year, 70, 80% through it, I've been having internal discussions about, wow, I really don't want to do this anymore. I understand if someone's mental health is not good, they might need to take some time off, readjust, get whatever help they need. But I always try to encourage people if they're able to finish, because it's, it's a very awkward position to be in by having an MD degree but but not having residency training, because in the US, you're, you're very limited in what you can do. There's very few states where even with an internship where you can practice, and, and unlike 20, I'm just making up a number, but 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I'll go further back, it's, it seemed like the degree by itself might help you get your foot in the door. There's so many qualified people now looking for extra non, non-clinical work, consulting assignments, things like that. The talent pool seems to have really increased. And, and I think that's an important point that residency training never hurts completing it, being board eligible and certainly being board certified is a plus point that it's like an objective marker that all these companies look at to hire, I think. And you're, yeah. you're right. It's the, the other thing that you said is it's such a connected world that you could be the most qualified person in your field, but if you don't have some online presence and LinkedIn is the go-to professional network. And then you mentioned Doximity. Obviously, that's big for physicians also. Very important points. I see a lot of frustration online from pediatricians every single day because the younger ones coming out, they're obviously not compensated fairly like some other specialties. I actually just saw a Twitter or X post today about someone talking about the fellowship matches that just came out. I think it was today or yesterday and, and how infectious disease particularly is like on the adult and pediatric side is just not compensated the same as something like cardiology or critical care. Or, and, and we've just gone through the worst pandemic in a hundred years. Do, do people reach out to you asking for your advice about whether you would go into it again? Not that anyone should pick a career based on money, but the reality is that the older you get and should you choose to have a family and live in a high cost of living state, it really makes a huge difference. And I think everyone went into this field for altruistic reasons to help other people, but on a day-to-day -day basis, it really hurts depending on what field you're in. Yeah, I get asked all the time, 
not just by friends and family and co colleagues who are just thinking about entering or their children are going to medical school, but also friends who are maybe my age and thinking, how do I get out and finish my working years doing something else? This is what I would say is, and I tell this to friends who have children who want to go to med school. If this is what you want to do, then you should do it. No questions asked, but you have to understand that it's not what it was. I'm not even going to say when I was coming out of residency, the generation before me where you could have your own practice and be very successful and live a very comfortable lifestyle. It's just, you're more likely to become an employer of a large group where you don't have the autonomy and a lot of the income or money that you're billing or bringing in is going to support a big organization and not necessarily you. So you just have to accept that. Primary care is extremely challenging, and especially pediatrics. I think it's a very hard field to go into with all of the nurse practitioners and the PAs coming in. It does make it more challenging. Sometimes you're almost more of a supervisor of others who are doing some of the work. But if it's your passion, then by all means, there's always going to be a need for great positions in all areas. The system is just not set up at this moment to support us as primary care physicians. It's just not a priority, unfortunately. And I, I tried to fight it for a long time. And I think we did a good job by building our big group. But then I think there's other opportunities that come along and sometimes it's worth just with just taking a, a leap and, and doing that. Yeah, you're right. You got to roll with the punches and do what's best for yourself and your family. Um, yeah. And also you can, you'll find that outside of clinical practice, there are so many different places for physicians with the degree, the knowledge, the experience. That, that they're needed, whether it be working, I work at a CRO now, whether you're working in pharma, you could work for insurance uh, payers. I'm not a huge fan of that, but it could happen someday. Teaching, there's just a lot of different places where physicians are needed, not necessarily going to an office every day and seeing 20, 30, 40 patients. You have to look though, and you have to grind at it. You have to, sometimes you have to take that first position out of clinical practice that may not be the perfect one for you, but understanding that it's going to lead to other opportunities. So. Yeah. So a, a CRO, I just had to look that up while we were talking. So it's a contract research organization, right? That's correct. Yeah. So basically contract research organizations, there's probably a hundred CROs around the world. I did not know what a CRO was when I joined Premier, the company I work for now. They had to explain it to me. Basically. If you think about drug development or device development, most of the, we call them sponsors or companies out there that are trying to bring a drug to market or trying to bring a device to market, they don't have the wherewithal to usher their IP through the FDA to organize and execute a clinical trial. So they hire a CRO to do the work. And it's not just small companies, big companies do it too. For example, when Pfizer and Moderna were both developing COVID vaccine, the mRNA vaccines, they both used CROs. Now, big CROs, because those were 30, 40,000 patient trials. The trials that I work on are much smaller, usually a dozen patients up to maybe 100 or 200. You know, rare disease, it's sometimes hard just to find 10 for your clinical trial. That's what CROs do. And we're medical affairs is a small part of that. We also have everything from CMC, which is uh, chemistry manufacturing and controls. It's like the drug product itself to regulatory, to data management, to medical writing, and the list goes on and on project managers, clinical research associates. There's huge teams that work to execute clinical trials and there's a whole industry, the CRO industry that supports clinical development. That's where I am now. It's really a fascinating place to work if you're interested in cutting edge medicine. Just using Doximity as an example, I read uh, on Doximity quite a bit, or it could be anywhere where they're talking about drug development. I read about companies that we've worked with or we are working with, and it's very exciting. They never mention us, but we're doing a lot of the grunt work to get the drug to market. It's, it's, it's exciting, exciting stuff. That's great. And then going from 
clinical medicine for 15 years to being recruited into this role and to, it must have felt like a large <laughs> steep learning curve did you have like formal guidance or did you just have to hit the ground running and attend meetings and just insert yourself into the team that's just the way it is i think in industry yeah. is it's a huge leap i just remember saying to my wife and my kids i said oh my goodness, this is just the strangest world that I've entered. They talk in a whole different language and they act differently. It's nothing like what I'm used to, but it's very interesting. Every day I, I learn different things. You know how you just Googled CRO? I Google things all day long. And not only that, but colleagues will say to me, what does this mean? I'm like, I don't know, let's Google it. Let's look it up. And then there's a lot of TLAs, three-letter acronyms. It's all about the TLAs. Everybody's speaking in three-letter acronyms. but I guess that's why we went into medicine, right? I went into medicine because I like to learn and learn new things and learn new tools. And they didn't teach me PowerPoint in medical school, but I used PowerPoint all day long, Excel spreadsheets, got to teach yourself or ask somebody for help. It's constantly learning new things. It's, it's great. I would encourage if you're a physician and you wanted to try something else, this is a, this is one place to look would be the Sierra world. It's a very interesting place to be in the cutting edge of drug discovery. That's amazing. I was going to ask you, but since Andwise is focused on financial wellness and trying to help people behind Ooh. us in their career trajectory, every guest I ask based on their own experiences, do they have any pearls of wisdom, any avoid this, do that? And again, none of this is like formal legal yeah. accounting or uh, financial advice. We're just, just me informally mentoring people because I, I think there's a lot of unknown unknowns until something happens to you or a colleague. A lot of times you're just not taught this stuff. I even know MD MBAs or DO MBAs and you know, learned stuff. I was an economics major in undergrad that hasn't helped me with any of my personal finance. Is there anything yeah. that you can think about your last, like either your current career or your 15 years yeah. of practice or before that? This is what I would say. I think it's changing, but when you have, or maybe it's not, and who knows, this could be just my perception being a physician, but you're always going to be a target. People are going to always look at you as a source of money for something because, you know, you have an advanced degree. They assume you have a career where you're earning a decent living. Just be careful. If it sounds too good to be true, we say that all the time, but it's so true. Six years into my career, six years into practice, I was just getting there. I was just paying my loans off, starting to go from not having anything to being able to go out to eat. We had just had our second son and we were thinking about having a third child. Everything was just moving slow. It's very slow at first, moving in the right direction. And somebody very close to us, not gonna go into any further details, asked if I was interested in investing in some property. The housing market was on fire at the time and we did. And it was just a huge mistake. It just was just a big mistake. That's what I would say is you're going to be a target forever and ever. Just be very careful. Make sure you protect yourself. Lawyers, you should always have lawyers read your contracts. I know Andwise is going to have some really good tools for contract. I would be less worried about a contract with a big hospital system that you're joining because those are probably almost boilerplates where they've been reviewed by thousands of lawyers. But if you get into small agreements with people that are loaning money here and there, run it past somebody and say, does this make sense to you? Am I protected if something goes bad? What happens if this all blows up in my face? You want to trust people, but you got to be careful because yeah. you never know what's going to happen, even if it's out of that person's hand. It was a very rough period of time for me for about four years where I just didn't know what was going to happen. I was skirting on the edges of survival financially. And fortunately we got out of it, but it was not a pleasant experience. That's my biggest piece of advice to anyone who has an advanced degree or physician is just be really, just be careful. Don't do stupid things just because you like the person or their family member or whatever, because it could really wrap you up for a long time and make it hard to get out of it.
Yeah, you're, uh, you're absolutely right. And I'm, I'm sorry that happened to you. You're, you're not the only one. It's very common. One of our medical advisory board members talks about how one of his high school buddies contacted him out of nowhere and sold him a very expensive life insurance, whole life insurance policy and tens of thousands of dollars every year premium. It was just money that he considered just wasted for years and years. And you're right. Physicians are still targets. And now in this interconnected world, it's easier. I get inundated every single day with cold emails or LinkedIn. And <laughs> some of these offers are like quite outrageous. And you're right. Yeah. You need to have a he healthy degree of skepticism. Yes. And the, the lawyer issue is also very spot on. Just because we are smart in our own particular fields and have gone through advanced degrees, we don't understand the intricacies of investments and what we are on the hook for and what our risk could be. Uh, it, although you didn't share any details, I had a colleague that similar sort of situation. He was approached to invest in a hotel and he asked me because he knows that I'm doing advice. And my advice was like, get a lawyer, do not sign anything, do not send any checks until your lawyer has gone through the paperwork. I ran into him recently about a month after that initial conversation. He said, yeah, when my lawyer sent them a bunch of very simple questions, they just ghosted me. They didn't write back. And these are yep. supposedly like close friends of theirs, probably dodged a bullet. This is also some of these, besides people we know, not that everyone has any nefarious intentions, but there's also now a lot of people that try to establish trust because they're physicians themselves and entering into fields that they weren't originally in. Not that all, all of those people are bad either. Some of them have been incredibly successful, but there's a whole bunch of physician real estate syndicators now and XYZ. And even in the last two years, a whole bunch of variables have changed. The stock market brokerage firms like to have the disclaimer that past performance doesn't equal future return. So many sure. things have changed with just the uh, mortgage interest rate that just because those people were wildly successful two years ago, there's no guarantee. And, exactly. and, and for most of us being W2 employees, we're in the highest tax bracket and it takes a long time to save money. So for that to suddenly be taken away from you in some sort of investment, yeah, it's very difficult. So have you, is there anything that you've found to be successful? Like a lot of people talk about just the quote unquote boring sort of three fund portfolio index funds. Is that predominantly what you've been doing for the majority of your career now or? Absolutely. There's no other way to do it. I, I don't think there's any other way to do it. There is a great podcast. It's about 45 minutes long. I'm, I'm going to look it up right now. It's a Freakonomics podcast. It's episode 297 of Freakonomics Radio. It's called The Stupidest Thing You Can Do With Your It is 48 minutes long. And I tell everybody, you just need to listen to that. It talks all about index fund investing and interviewing the individuals who started index fund, John Bogle, who found Vanguard, Eugene Fama. I'm just reading it from the University of Chicago. You have to listen to the 48 minutes and it will forever change your thinking of investing. If you don't already think this way, which is if you're investing for the long run, just put your money in low cost index funds and you will beat almost any other investment period. There's just nothing that's beaten it over time. Maybe real estate, if you know where to put your money, but I mean, I, I would strongly suggest anybody who is just starting out is starting to put their money away into an IRA or 401k or 403b. The way to do it is to listen to this Freakonomics podcast and get your money to Vanguard or Fidelity or Schwab. Just pump it into index funds, set it and forget it. Do not look at it until you're ready to retire. Just lock it away and move on. Yeah, you're right. I, I heard once like a couple of years ago that Warren Buffett apparently has told his wife that after he passes, that's what she should do with the money, even though yeah. he's been like wildly successful in buying up individual companies. He's told her to put all the money in index funds. So. Yeah, I think that's the way to go. I mean, I, I, I think it, they make the strong case that you, you may you may find a Warren Buffett, but for every Warren Buffett, you're going to find three or four losers. Yeah, it's just, and, and I love to see that these hedge funds post these incredible gains they made over the last year. But if you look at how they did the year before, they got destroyed. 
it's not consistent. And the point is you're looking for returns in the long run that are relatively safe and nothing is completely safe other than putting the money under your mattress, perhaps uh, even government bonds have their issues, but in the long run, index fund investing is the way to go. There are firms out there that'll help you do it for a fee, which I think is, if you're really not sure, then go for it. Something like personal capital, which is, I think is now empower or betterment. Um, they have programs for those who want to just index fund invest and they'll even manage it for you for a very small fee, which is well worth it versus paying a advisor 1% or 1.5% a year to churn your account, which just drives me crazy. Brings you back to the whole life insurance thing, which is also something that drives me crazy, but I'm not going to go off on that tangent right now. <laughs> yeah. Switching topics to something random, I asked people about it because I didn't grow up in New Jersey. I grew up in Sydney, Australia, but I ended up marrying a Jersey girl and they never leave. So now I live in South Jersey. You went to med school here, then you trained in Manhattan. And then did you ever consider moving to a low cost of living area or do you have family ties here? How, how did you? Yeah, yeah that, this is a great question. And this is, I think, is something that is important to think about. New Jersey is, I think, the highest cost state. If not, if it's not the highest cost, it's close to it. My family was all here. My parents now live in Florida. My sister has moved to Florida. My brother has moved to Massachusetts for various reasons. I'm the only one in my immediate family left. I pay an insane amount of money in property taxes. Plus, I have the 6% state income tax. But what do I get for that? What do I get for that bill that I pay every month? My children went to public school. They went to some of the best public schools you can imagine. I have three sons. To put them in private school, which I probably would have had to do in many parts of Florida or, I don't know, other parts where there's no taxes, would have cost me far more than what I pay in my property tax, not even close. I have access to the beach, skiing, New York City, great restaurants, great people. I wouldn't trade it for the world. Now, once my kids are up and out of the house, we're probably going to go somewhere where a little quieter. It's very population dense here. It's a lot of traffic, maybe Cape Cod or maybe somewhere in Florida near my parents. But I think you get what you pay for in many instances. My friends who live in Florida, they all have to put their kids in private school and they pay an insane amount of money for that. Far more than I pay in my property taxes. So, and prop, not maybe not my income tax, but I don't know. I think it's a calculation and, and you get what you pay for. I think New Jersey is fantastic. I don't know how you feel about it, but I love living in Jersey. Yeah, it's growing on me. It's been like more than a decade and we're not going anywhere because my kids are seven, five, and three and same situation. Although our property taxes are very high, private school tuition for grade school now, I'm shocked, is the same as I paid for NYU undergrad 20 years ago. Yeah. And, and multiply that by three kids. That's much more than my property taxes. Uh, luckily, we're in a good school system as well. Yeah. And you have the same points that my wife often tells me that we have four seasons here. We're between two great cities and easy access to everything. New York City, Boston, Philadelphia, DC, everything within four hours. I can go do anything I want whenever I want to do it. Yeah. But for some, for some people that I now, time only moves in one direction. I guess for some people, if they have had residency training or something, a number of years to live in another location, and if they find a lower cost of living area, it can make a difference to your day-to-day -day budget or the internal pressure you feel to get XYZ salary, right? Or you, whether your spouse has to work full-time, whether you have to work no full-time. So these are, but the, being on the career path that we're all on, I find a lot of people end up settling close and might just be biased because it's happened to all my friends around me, but you spend a number of years in med school, then residency, and it, perhaps your first job offer is quite close by. So a lot of people end up settling close to where they did residency or fellowship. Let me tell you, my, my middle son is at University of Colorado now in Boulder. It is just incredible there. I'd love to live there, but we're just, we're here. But we are so fortunate that we live in this country where there are so many amazing places. You like warm weather, you can go live somewhere where it's warm. You like a cold, you like the golf, you like to go hiking, skiing, you like the ocean. There's endless choices here. I feel very lucky. And I went undergrad at University of Michigan. I was there for four years. I told my parents when I was there, I said, I don't understand how you could have lived your entire life in New Jersey. 
I love Michigan. I'm never leaving here. And then I left, <laughs> never went back because it was quieter. Ann Arbor's like a little paradise, but eh, so is New Jersey. New Jersey's paradise too. Just a different kind of paradise. Yeah. I was obsessed with Manhattan when I did residency there. And then we had our first kid. It was still okay. Second kid, we moved to Jersey City. Third kid, we had to move closer to grandparents because you realize you need space to spread out and yeah. there's nothing like having support around. So That's for sure. Yeah, We're coming up on time, but any other things come to mind that we haven't covered? Thank you so much for all your thoughts. It's the whole purpose of this podcast is to pick people's brain and you've given us so much to think about. So I appreciate yeah. it. I mean, I would say just what I said, which is don't do stupid things, which I did once and I've done a lot of stupid things, but one really stupid thing and listen to that podcast. If you don't know what to do with your money, if you're confused, if you're being approached by financial advisors who want to churn your account and charge you high fees. That's to me is foolish. Listen to the podcast. It tells a great story and it's uh, time tested. Not my podcast. It's Freakonomics. I just happen to love it. Yeah, I like those guys. I, I've listened to their book and good, great content. Um, thanks again. We will share your LinkedIn in the show notes if that's okay. In case sure. people want to reach out to you about learning about CROs, young, you know, yeah, sure. med medical students or residents. Um, yeah. and then we'll, we'll share the podcast that you mentioned. Um, yeah, N nice thanks. speaking with you. Thanks again. Thanks so much for your All time. Right.